ask you to please follow the textbooks as I read it for you. Also make note of all the tabular illustrations and descriptions. It will help you read and learn it better. So let us start. The first chapter here is the rise of nationalism in Europe. In 1848, Frederick Sorio, a French artist, prepared a series of four prints visualizing his dream of a world made up of democratic and social republics, as he called them. The first print of the series shows the people of Europe and America, men and women of all ages and social classes, marching in a long train and offering homage to the Statue of Liberty as they pass by it. As you would recall, the artists of the time of the French Revolution personified liberty as a female figure. Here, you can recognize the torch of enlightenment she bears in one hand and the charter of the rights of man in the other. On the earth in the foreground of the image lie the shattered remains of the symbols of absolutist institutions. In Sorio's utopian vision, the people of the world are grouped as distinct nations identified through their flags and national costume. Leading the procession way past the Statue of Liberty are the United States and Switzerland, which by this time were already nation-states. France, identifiable by the revolutionary tricolor, has just reached the statue. She is followed by the peoples of Germany bearing the black, red and gold flag. Interestingly, at the time when Sorio created this image, the German people did not yet exist as a United Nation. The flag they carry is an expression of liberal hopes in 1848 to unify the numerous German-speaking principalities into a nation-state under a democratic constitution. Following the German peoples are the people of Austria, the Kingdom of Two Sicilies, Lombardy, Poland, England, Ireland, Hungary and Russia. From the heavens above, Christ, saints and angels gaze upon the scene. They have been used by the artist to symbolize fraternity among the nations of the world. This chapter would deal with many of the issues visualized by Sorio in Figure 1. During the 19th century, nationalism emerged as a force which brought about sweeping changes in the political and mental world of Europe. The end result of these changes was the emergence of the nation-state in place of the multinational dynastic empires of Europe. The concept and practices of a modern state in which a centralized power exercised sovereign control over clearly defined territory had been developing over a long period of time in Europe. But a nation-state was one in which the majority of its citizens and not only its rulers came to develop a sense of common identity and shared history or descent. This commonness did not exist from the time immemorial. It was forged through struggles, through the actions of leaders and the common people. This chapter will look at the diverse process through which nation-states and nationalism came into being in the 19th century Europe. Now let us see the source of all this. So uh, first on the first page are the new words. Absolutist. What does this mean? Literally a government or system of the rule that has no restraints on the power exercised. In history, the term refers to a form of monarchical government that was centralized, militarized and repressive. Utopian, a vision of a society that is so idle that it is unlikely to actually exist. Now source A. Ernst Renan, What is a Nation? In a lecture delivered at the University of Sorbonne in 1882, the French philosopher Ernst Renan 1823-92 outlined his understanding of what makes a nation. The lecture was subsequently published as a famous essay entitled Qu'est-ce que c'est, nation? What is a nation? In this essay, Renan criticizes the notion suggested by others that a nation is formed by a common language, race, religion, or territory. A nation is the culmination of a long past of endeavors, sacrifice, and devotion. A heroic past, great men glory, that is social capital upon which one bases a national idea. To have common glories in the past, to have a common will in the present, to have performed great deeds together, to wish to perform still more, 
these are the essential conditions of being a people a nation is therefore a large scale solidarity its existence is a daily plebiscite a province is its inhabitants if anyone has the right to be consulted it is inhabitant a nation never has any real interest in annexing or holding on to a country's against its will the existence of nations is a good thing a necessity even their existence is a guarantee of liberty which would be lost if the world has had only one law and only one master new words plebiscite a direct vote by which all the people of religion are asked to accept or reject a proposal french revolution and the idea of the nation the first clear expression of nationalism came with the french revolution in 1789 France as you would remember was a full fledged territorial state in 1789 under the rule of an absolute monarch the political and constitutional changes that came in the wake of the french revolution led to the transfer of sovereignty from the monarchy to a body of french citizens the revolution proclaimed that it was the people who would henceforth constitute the nation and shape its destiny From the very beginning the French revolutionaries introduced various measures and practices that could create a sense of collective identity amongst the French people. The idea of la patrie the fatherland and le citoyen the citizen emphasized the notion of a united community enjoying equal rights under a constitution. A friend a new French flag the tricolor was chosen to replace the former royal standard. The Estates General was elected by the body of active citizens and renamed the National Assembly. New hymns were composed, oaths taken and martyrs commemorated all in the name of the nation. A centralized administrative system was put in place and it formulated uniform laws for all citizens within its territory. Internal custom duties and dues were abolished and a uniform system of ways and measure was adopted. Regional dialects were discouraged and French as it was spoken and written in Paris became the common language of nation. The revolutionaries further declared that it was the mission and the destiny of French nation to liberate the people of Europe from despotism and in other words to help other people of Europe to become nations. When the news of the events in France reached the different cities of Europe students and other members of educated middle classes began setting setting up jacobin clubs the activities and campaigns prepared the way for the french armies which moved into holland belgium switzerland and much of italy in 1790s with the outbreak of the revolutionary wars the french armies began to carry the idea of nationalism abroad Within the wide swath of territory that came under his control, Napoleon set about introducing many of the reforms that he had already introduced in France. Through a return of monarchy, Napoleon had no doubt destroyed democracy in France, but in the administrative field he had incorporated revolutionary principles in order to make the whole system more rational and efficient. The Civil Code of 1804 usually known as napoleonic code did away with all privileges based on birth established equality before the law and secured the right to property this code was exported to the regions under french control in the dutch republic in switzerland in italy and germany napoleon simplified administrative divisions abolished the feudal system and freed peasants from serfdom and manorial dues in the towns too guild restrictions were removed transport and communication systems were improved peasants artisans workers and new businessmen enjoyed a new found freedom businessmen and small scale producers of good in particular began to realize that uniform laws standardized weights and measures and a common national currency would facilitate the movement and exchange of goods and capital from one region to another however in the areas conquered 
the reactions to the local populations to French rule were mixed. Initially, in many places such as Holland and Switzerland, as well as in certain cities like Brussels, Mainz, Milan, Warsaw, the French armies were welcomed as harbingers of liberty. But the initial enthusiasm soon turned into hostility. As it became clear that the new administrative arrangements did not go hand in hand with the political freedom, increased taxation, censorship forced, conscription into the French armies required to conquer the rest of Europe. All seemed to outweigh the advantages of administrative changes. Of nationalism in Europe. If you look at the map of mid 18th century Europe, you will find that there were no nation states as we know them today. What we know today as Germany, Italy and Switzerland were divided into kingdoms, duchies and cantons, whose rulers had their autonomous territories. Eastern and Central Europe were under autocratic monarchies within the territories of which lived diverse people. They did not see themselves as sharing a collective identity or a common culture. Often they even spoke different languages and belonged to different ethnic groups. The Habsburg Empire that ruled over Austria-Hungary, for example, was a patchwork of many different regions and people. It included the Alpine regions, the Tyrol, the Austria, and the Sudentland, as well as Bohemia, where aristocracy was predominantly German-speaking. It also included the Italian-speaking provinces of Lombardy and Venetia. In Hungary, half of the population speak Magyar, while the other half spoke a variety of dialects. In Galicia, the aristocracy spoke Polish. Besides these three dominant groups, they, were also, they also lived within the boundaries of the empire, a mass of subject peasant people, Bohemians and Slovaks to the north, Slovenes in Carniola, Croats to the south, and Romans to the east in Transylvania. Such differences did not easily promote a sense of political unity. The only tie binding these diverse groups together was a common elegance to the emperor. How did nationalism and the idea of na nation-state emerge? Now look at some important dates. 1797, Napoleon invades Italy, Napoleonic War begins. 1814 to 1815, fall of Napoleon, the Vienna Peace Settlement. 1821, Greek struggle for independence begins. 1848, revolutions in Europe, artisans, industrial workers and peasants revolt against economic hardships. Middle classes demand constitutions and representative governments. Italian, German, Magyars, Poles, Czechs, etc. demand nation states. 1859 to 1870, unification of Italy. 1866 to 1871, unification of Germany. 1905, Slav nationalism gathers force in Habsburg and Ottoman empires. Aristocracy and the new middle class. Socially and politically, a landed aristocracy was the dominant class of the continent. The members of this class were united by the common way of life that cut across regional divisions. They owned estates in the countryside and also townhouses. They spoke French for the purposes of diplomacy and in high society. Their families were often connected by ties of marriage. This powerful aristocracy was, however, numerically a small group. The majority of the population was, was made up of peasantry. To the west, the bulk of the land was farmed by tenants and small owners, while in the eastern and central Europe, the pattern of land holding was characterized by vast estates which were cultivated by serfs. In western and parts of central Europe, the growth of industrial production and trade meant the growth of towns and the emergence of commercial classes whose existence was based on production of the market. Industrialization began in England in the second half of the 18th century, but in France and parts of German states it occurred only during the 19th century. In its wake, new social groups came into being. A working class population and the middle classes made up of industrialist business businessmen professionals. In Central and Eastern Europe, these groups were smaller in number till late 19th century. It was among the educated liberal middle classes that ideas of national unity following the abolition of aristocratic privileges gained pop nationalism stand for. Ideas of national unity in early 19th century, Europe were closely allied to the ideology of liberalism. The term liberalism derives from the Latin root liber, meaning free. For the new middle classes, liberalism stood for the freedom for the individual and equality of all before law. 
politically. It emphasized the concept of the government by consent. Since the French Revolution, liberalism had stood for the end of autocracy and clerical privileges, a constitution and representative government through parliament. 19th century, liberals also stretched the inviability of private property. Yet equality before the law did not necessarily stand for universal suffrage. You will recall the in that in revolutionary France, which marked the first political experiment in liberal democracy, the right to vote and to get elected was granted exclusively to property-owning men. Men without property and all women were excluded from political rights. Only for a brief period under the Jacobins did all adult males enjoy suffrage. However, the Napoleonic Code went back to limited suffrage and reduced women to the status of a minor subject to the authority of fathers and husbands. Throughout the 19th and early 20th century, women and non-propertied men organized opposition movements demanding equal political rights. New word here is suffrage, which means the right to vote. In the economic sphere, liberalism stood for the freedom of markets and the abolition of the state-imposed restrictions on the movement of goods and capital. During the 19th century, this was a strong demand of the emerging middle classes. Let us take the example of the German-speaking regions in the first half of the 19th century. Napoleon's administrative measures had created out of countless small principalities a confederation of 39 states. Each of these possessed its own currency and weights and measures. A merchant traveling in 1833 from Hamburg to Nuremberg to sell his goods would have had to pass through 11 custom barriers and pay a custom duty of about 5% at each one of them. Duties were often levied according to the weight and measurement of the goods. At each region had its own system of weights and measures. This involved time-consuming calculations. The measure of cloth, for example, was L, which in each region stood for a different length. An L of textile material, material bought in Frankfurt would get you 54.7 cm of cloth. In Mainz, 55.1 cm. In Nuremberg, 65.6 cm. In Freiburg, 53.5 cm. Such conditions were viewed as obstacles to economic exchange and growth by the new commercial classage classes who argued for the creation of unified economic territory allowing the unhindered movement of goods, people and capital. In 1834, a customs union or Zollverein was formed as the initiative of Prussia and joined by the German, most of the German states. The union abolished tariff barriers and reduced the number of currencies from the over 30 to 2. The creation of a network of railways further stimulated mobility, harnessing economic interest to the nation. Unification. A wave of economic nationalism strengthened the wider nationalist sentiments growing at that time. After 1815. Following the defeat of Napoleon in 1815, European governments were driven by a spirit of conservatism. Conservatives believed that established traditional institutions of state and society like the monarchy, the church, social hierarchies, property and the family should be preserved. Most conservatives, however, did not propose a return to the society of pre-revolutionary days. Rather, they realized from the changes initiated by Napoleon that modernization could in fact strengthen traditional institutions like the monarchy. It could make state powerful more effective and strong. A modern army, an efficient bureaucracy, a dynamic economy, the abolition of feudalism and serfdom could strengthen the autocratic monarchies of Europe. New words, conservatism, a political philosophy that stressed the importance of traditional established institutions and customs and preferred gradual development to quick change. In 1815, representatives of the European powers retained Russia, Prussia and Austria, who had collectively defeated Napoleon, met at Vienna to draw up a settlement for Europe. The Congress was hosted by the Austrian Chancellor Duke Metternich. 
the delegates drew up the Treaty of Vienna of 1815 with the objective of undoing most of the changes that had come about in Europe during the Napoleonic Wars. The Bourbon dynasty, which had been deposed during the French Revolution, was restored to power and France lost the territories it had annexed under Napoleon. A series of states were set up on the boundaries of France to prevent French expansion in future. Thus, the Kingdom of Netherlands, which included Belgium, was set up in the north and Genoa was added to Piedmont in the south. It was given important new territories on its western front frontiers, while Austria was given control of northern Italy. But the German Confederation of 39 states that had been set up by Napoleon was left untouched. In the east, Russia was given part of Poland. Prussia was given a portion of Saxony. The main intention was to restore the monarchies that had been overthrown by Napoleon and create a new conservative order in Europe. Conservative regimes set up in 1815 were autocratic. They did not tolerate criticism and dissent and sought to curb activities that questioned the legitimacy of autocratic government. Most of them imposed censorship laws to control what was said in newspapers, books, plays and songs and reflected the ideas of liberty and freedom. Associated with the French Revolution The memory of French Revolution nonetheless continued to inspire liberals. One of the major issues taken up by the liberal nationalists who criticized the new conservative order was freedom of the press. The Revolutionaries During the year following 1815, the fear of repression drove many liberal nationalists underground. Secret societies sprang up in many European states to train revolutionaries and spread their ideas. To be revolutionary at this time meant a commitment to oppose monarchical forms that had been established after the Vienna Congress and to fight for liberty and freedom. Most of these revolutionaries also saw the creation of national states as a necessary part of this struggle for freedom. One such individual was the Italian revolutionary Giuseppe Mazzini, born in Genoa in 1807. He became a member of the secret society of the Carbonari. As a young man of 24, he was sent into exile in 1831 for attempting a revolution in Linguria. He subsequently founded two more underground societies, first Young Italy in Marseilles and then Young Europe in Bernay whose members were like-minded young men for Poland, France, Italy and the German states. Mazzini believed that God had intended nations to be the natural units of mankind, so Italy could not continue to be a patchwork of small states and kingdoms. It had to be forged into a single unified republic within a wider alliance of nations. This unification alone could be the basis of Italian liberty. Following his model, secret societies were set up in Germany, France, Switzerland and Poland. Mazzini's relentless opposition to monarchy and his vision of democratic republics frightened the conservatives. Metznik described him as the most dangerous enemy of our social order. Revolutions 1830-1848 As conservative regimes tried to consolidate their power, liberalism and nationalism came to be increasingly associated with revolution in many regions of Europe, such as Italian and German states, the province of the Ottoman Empire, Ireland and Poland. These revolutions were led by the liberal nationalists belonging to the educated middle class elite, among whom were professors, school teachers, clerks and members of the commercial middle classes. The first upheaval took place in France in July 1830. The Bourbon kings, who had been restored to power during the conservative reaction after 1815, were now overthrown by liberal revolutionaries who installed a constitutional monarchy with Louis Philippe at its head. When France sneezes, Metternich once remarked, the rest of the Europe catches cold. The July revolution sparked an uprising in Brussels, which led to Belgium breaking away from United Kingdom of Netherlands. 
An event that mobilized nationalist feelings among the educated elite across Europe was the Greek War of Independence. Greece had been a part of Ottoman Empire since the 15th century. The growth of revolutionary nationalism in Europe sparked off a struggle for independence among the Greeks, which began in 1821. Nationalists in Greece got support from other Greeks living in exile and also from many Western Europeans who had sympathies for ancient Greek culture. Poets and artists lauded Greece as the cradle of European civilization and mobilized public opinion to support its struggle against a Muslim empire. The English poet Lord Byron organized funds and later went to fight in the war, where he died of fever in 1824. Finally, the Treaty of Constantinople of 1832 recognized Greece as an independent nation. The Romantic Imagination and National Feeling The development of nationalism did not come about only through wars and territorial expansion. Culture played an important role in creating the idea of the nation. Art and poetry, stories and music help express and shape nationalist feelings. Let us look at Romanticism, a cultural movement which sought to develop a particular form of nationalist sentiment. Romantic artists and poets generally criticize the glorification of reason and science. and focus instead on emotions, institutions and mystic feeling. Their effort was to create a sense of a shared collective heritage, a common cultural past as the basis of a nation. Other romantics such as German philosopher John Gottfried Herder claimed that true German culture was to be discovered among the common people, thus woke. It was through folk songs, folk poetry and folk dances that the true spirit of nation was popularized. So collecting and recording these forms of folk culture was essential to the project of nation building. The emphasis on vernacular language and the collection of local folklore was not just to recover an ancient national spirit but also to carry the modern nationalist message to large audience who were mostly illiterate. This was especially so in the case of Poland, which had been partitioned at the end of 18th century by the great powers Russia, Russia and Austria. Even though Poland no longer existed as an independent territory, national feeling were kept alive through music and language. Karol Kurpinski, for example, celebrated the national struggle through his operas and music, turning folk dances like the Polonaise and Muzurka into nationalist symbols. Language too played an important role in developing nationalist sentiments. After Russian occupation, the Polish language was forced out of schools and the Russian language was imposed everywhere. In 1831, an armed rebellion against Russian rule took place, which was ultimately crushed. Following this, many members of clergy in Poland began to use language as a weapon of national resistance. Polish was used for church gatherings and all religious instructions. As a result, a large number of priests and bishops were put in jail or sent to Siberia by the Russian authorities as punishment for their refusal to preach in Russian. The use of Polish came to be seen as symbol of the struggle against Russian dominance. Hunger, Hardship and Popular Revolt The 1830s were years of great economic hardship in Europe. The first half of 19th century saw an enormous increase in population all over Europe. In most countries, there were more seekers of job than employment. Population from rural areas migrated to the cities to live in overcrowded slums. Small producers in towns were often faced with stiff competition from imports of cheap machine-made goods from England, where industrialization was more advanced than on the continent. This was specially so in textile production, which was carried out mainly in homes or small workshops and was only partly mechanized. In those regions of Europe, where the aristocracy still enjoyed power, peasants struggled under the burden of feudal dues and obligations. The rise of food prices of a year of bad harvest led to widespread pauperism in town and country. The year 1848 was one such year. Food shortages and widespread unemployment brought the population of Paris out on the roads. Barricades were erected and Louis Philippe was forced to flee. 
a national assembly proclaimed a republic granted suffrage to all adult males above 21 and guaranteed the right to work. National workshops to provide employment were set up. Earlier, in 1845, weavers and in Silesia had led a revolt against contractors who supplied them raw material and gave them orders for finished textiles which drastically reduced their payments. The generalist Wilhelm Wolf described the event in Silesian village as follows. In these villages, cotton weaving is the most widespread occupation. The misery of the workers is extreme. The desperate need for jobs has been taken advantage of by the contractors to reduce the prices of the goods they order. On 4 June, at 2 p.m., a large crowd of weavers emerged from their homes and marched in pairs up to the mansion of their contractor demanding higher wages. They were treated like scones and threats alternately. Following this, a group of them forced their way into the house, smashed its elegant window panes, furniture, porcelain. Another group broke into the storehouse and plundered it off supplies of cloth, which they tore to shreds. The contractor fled with his family to a neighboring village, which never refused to shelter such a person. He returned 24 hours later, having requisitioned the army. In the exchange that followed, 11 beavers were shot. 1848. The Revolution of the Liberals Parallel to the revolts of the poor, unemployed and starving peasants and workers in many European countries in the year 1848, a revolution led by the educated middle classes was underway. Events of February 1848 in France had brought about the abdication of the monarch and a public based on universal male suffrage had been proclaimed. In other parts of Europe, where independent nation states did not yet exist, such as Germany, Italy, Poland, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, men and women of liberal and middle classes, liberal middle, middle classes combined their demands for constitutionalism with national unification. They took advantage of the growing popular unrest to push their demands for the creation of a nation state on parliamentary principles, a constitution, freedom of the press and freedom of association. In the German regions, a large number of political associations whose members were middle-class professionals, businessmen and prosperous artisans came together in the city of Frankfurt and decided to vote for an all-German National Assembly. On 18th May 1848, 831 elected representatives marched in a festive procession to take their places in Frankfurt Parliament, convent in the Church of St. Paul. They drafted a constitution for a German nation to be headed by a monarchy subject to a parliament. When the deputies offered the crown on these terms of Frederick Wilhelm IV, King of Prussia, he rejected it and joined other monarchs to oppose the elected assembly. While the opposition of the aristocracy and military became stronger, the social basis of parliament eroded. The parliament was dominated by the middle classes who resisted the demand of workers and artisans and subsequently lost their support. In the end, troops were called in and the army was forced to disband. The issue of extending political rights to women was controversial, one within the liberal movement in which large number of women had participated actively over the years. Women had formed their own political associations, founded newspapers and taken part in political meetings and demonstrations. Despite this, they were denied suffrage right during the election of the assembly. When Frankfurt Parliament convened in Church of St. Paul, women were admitted only as observers to stand in the visitors' gallery. Though conservative forces were able to suppress liberal movements in 1848, they could not restore the old order. The monarchs were beginning to realize that the cycles of revolution and repression could only be ended by granted concession to the liberal nationalist revolutionaries. Hence, in the years after 1848, the autocratic monarchies of Central and Eastern Europe began to introduce the changes that had already taken place in Western Europe before 1815. Thus, serfdom and bonded labor were abolished both in Habsburg dominions and in Russia. The Had Habsburg rulers granted more autonomy to Hungarians in 1867. New word on this page is ideology, which means system of ideas reflecting a particular social and political vision. Another new word is feminist, awareness of women's rights and interests based on the belief of the social, economic and political equality of the gender.